I'm part of the fellowship. The fellowship. The fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of His. <clears throat> I won't look back, let up. Back away or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking. Smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, or popularity. I don't have to be right. Recognized, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith. Lean on his presence. Walk by patience. I'm uplifted by prayer and labor with power. My face is set. My gate is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions are few, but my guide is reliable. My mission is clear. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice. Hesitate in the presence of the enemy. Pander at the pool of popularity. Or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must keep going <clears throat> until he comes. Give until I drop. Preach until all know. And work until he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My banner will be clear. All right, Trinity Church, would you help me welcome out Ray Johnston? Good morning. Hey, so first of all, hi. hi. Y'all good? That's good. And so true confession time here, people. Um, I am a late night guy. And it's not even 10 yet. And um, how many of you are late night types? Where are you? All right. How many of you are early morning people? Yeah, my wife is. Matter of fact, come up, Carol, where are you? You're around here. My wife's around here somewhere. Um, the, uh, uh, my wife wakes up in the morning. Good morning, Lord. I wake up, good Lord, it's morning. <laughs> I, thought, I don't even believe in God until about 10 o'clock, so we should be about right there, so we're in business. Um, hey, uh, would you reach in to whatever you reach into around here and grab this out? This is a uh, message outline. It's going to make a lot of sense. Grab a pen if you want to take some notes. While you're getting that out, I want to introduce myself a little bit. Uh, my name is Ray Johnston, and I am very honored to be here because I have known your pastor a lot longer than you've known your pastor. And, and, and I want to say this, nice catch. <laughs> so he, it's interesting, uh, Todd is, I, I was, somebody the other day was saying, what do you like so much about him? And I said, here's what I like about him. I said, he's a very rare person. And the reason is this, he is both well-liked and well-respected. A lot of times you get neither, or you get one or the other, but God has not made very many leaders who are both well, they're deserving of respect, but you also like them. And this is going to be a great next 10, 20, whatever year run your church is going to have, um, because I believe God brought them here. And you have, in my opinion, you have one of the best West Coast pastors just getting started here at this church, and I hope you appreciate him. okay? So, yeah. A good guy. Now, that takes care of the introduction Todd wrote for me. No, I'm kidding. Um, and um, my, uh, my wife, Carol, and I uh, live in Northern California. We live in a town called Granite Bay. It's around, it's a little north of Sacramento. And it's, um, uh, and I was a professor and wrote books and traveled and spoke. And then uh, about 20 years ago, we had two copycat suicides of teenagers in our town, Granite Bay. And four people began to pray that God would raise up a church that would attract teenagers. Do we have any teenagers in here? Awesome. Yeah, we speak teenager there. And matter of fact, we're doing this Thrive Conference. You've probably heard it get announced. We're doing this Thrive Conference. Cut school in Jesus' name and come to this thing, okay? Um, we, and this group of four people began to pray that God would raise up a church that would attract teenagers. And then they came to me and said, uh, you're the teenage guy. Would you do that? And I said, No. You know that verse in the Bible says, Lord, here am I, send somebody else? I applied that verse. Well, six months later, God twisted my arm, and we launched a church 
for people that don't like church, and we called it Bayside. We almost named it Baywatch, went with Bayside. That was probably a smart move. And, um, and it started, get this, I, I literally went, this is not gonna happen. Our, our first meeting had 26 people. And I walked out and went, this isn't gonna happen. That 26 people last weekend was a little over 19,000 people. It is Teenageville, USA. I have never seen anything like it. And what's interesting is this. Um, you ever heard that term seeker church? Okay, we're not one of those things. I mean, we basically, we're like the in and out. <clears throat> we just had pastors in that I mentored this week and they said, describe your church. And I said, go to in and out Burger. That's us. Real simple menu. We gather, we worship and teach the Bible. But the very first time we did a service, we worshiped, I taught the Bible. But at the end of the message, I went, I think a bunch of these people aren't Christians because they were pretty sharp looking. And so I went, I'm gonna give an invitation. So I, at our very first service, which was not evangelistic service, I taught Ephesians too. I just went, hey, we, prayed, we led people to Christ. I said, if anybody here wants to be Christ, half the hands in the room went up of people that met Christ at our very first service. So that was 20 years ago. We're doing the same things now, and people are meeting, and the most unlikely people you've ever seen walk into our church. A while back I walk in, the biggest human being I've ever seen is sitting in the front row. And it's like the Hulk came to church. I mean, it's like this guy mess, and I just went big block of a guy. And now, he's taken up half the row. The other half is taken up by a big old dude too. He's a football coach who I know. I looked down at the end of the message, the Hulk has raised his paw, indicating he's given his life to Christ. Well, with so many people are becoming Christians and raising their hand. We put up a table and says, I raise my hand. We have a former LAPD cop who runs that table. I look over, the Hulk is going <laughs> over to the I raise my hand table, okay? That's the 930 service. Before the 1115 service, the football coach comes running backstage. He goes, hey, did you see the guy that was with me this morning? I go, everybody saw the guy that was with me this morning. <laughs> He goes, do you know who that is? I go, I got no idea. He says, he is the head bouncer at the largest nude bar in Sacramento. <laughs> and I said, how do you know that? You get a whole nother story. <laughs> so we are having a ball up there and it still feels like the first inning. And it's kind of fun because this service kind of feels like us. It's kind of a neat deal. Um, then what happened is this, we wanted to start a conference for anybody that wanted to have their spiritual batteries recharged, okay? So we launched this conference up there called Thrive, okay? And we bring in speakers, worship bands, I mean, kind of famous people all over the universe, and um, about 100 of them. And then we do 100 seminars, massive general sessions, worship bands. We fly in comedians, because way too many adult Christians' face looks like the front cover for the Book of Lamentations. And uh, <laughs> they just need to laugh. And we do a lot of screwing around. I got my kids, my kids when they were teenagers, I got them to cut school every year and brought them to Thrive because I want them to see adults act like this. And the roof gets blown off by these bands. It's incredible. Well, the one up north sold out. So last year, we did one in Palm Springs in early March because it was God's will in early March. And, uh, and the... And we thought about 500 people would be at the first one. It finally sold out at 2,000 people. And so we're doing that again. Your church gets a special rate, and there's even a student rate. And so if you want to come, we'd love to have you. I, it's, now, the problem is this. If you go online, it's sold out already, okay? It's March 1, 2, 3. But we're letting Todd sign up more people today. So if you want to come, come on out. We'd love to have you. It's a ball. And, um, and now, I want to drive into the message. Y'all y'all ready, by, by the way? Here we go, okay? Um, a few years ago, uh, my wife and I have four kids. We had two boys, thought we were done, and then surprise, she contracted pregnancy a third time. <laughs> and double surprise, it was twins. So we have identical twin daughters, okay? Matter of fact, we all meet in LA about five o'clock today. We're all flying to London to do a leadership conference. And, and, the, and so, we're, and so um, a while back, my daughter Leslie came home and she said, Dad, the, uh, the teacher... I have to write a paper on a leader. I went to the teacher and said, I want to write a paper on you, and they know who you are, and so the teacher said it was okay. She goes, so I'm going to write a paper on you, and she goes, I have 20 questions, and you have to answer them all honestly. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have kids. You want to do this with your kid? 
we have a jacuzzi in the backyard. I said, let's go do this in the jacuzzi because I thought I'm going to end up in hot water. Why don't you start there? So we go to the jacuzzi, we sit down, and she, we talk for two hours. We're like prunes at the end of this thing. She, and her last question was her best question. She looked at me and she said, what is the most important thing you do as, the, as a leader? Folks, let me ask you, what's the most important thing you do as a teenager? What's the most important thing you do as a Christian? What's the most important thing you do as a mom, dad, husband? What's a teenager? What's the most important thing you do so you'll actually have a good... What's the most important thing you do? You know, is, is there anything in your life where you're going, this is so important. If I do this, I'm going to have a great future. And if I don't do this, I bankrupt my future. Is there anything that important? And she asked me that question. And I, I looked at her and I said, that's the easiest question you've asked me. And if anybody thinks about it long enough, which unfortunately most Christians haven't, until they come to the same conclusion. And here it is. I looked right at my daughter and said, the most important thing I do is this. Make sure I stay encouraged. It's make sure I stay encouraged. And then she looked at me like you are like, what? And I said, think about it for a second. If, and would you all agree, if I'm not encouraged, I will never be the leader God wants me to be. Agreed? If I'm not encouraged, I will never be the pastor God. The last thing America needs are discouraged pastors. If I'm not encouraged, I will never be the communicator God. If I got up here this morning and said, all right, everybody, turn in your Bibles. This is going to be a bummer. If I'm not encouraged, I will never be the communicator God. And then I got choked up. I said, Honey, if I'm not encouraged, I will never be the dad you need me to be. And if I'm not encouraged, I will never be the husband mom dreams up I might be someday. <laughs> and if you guys know what I'm talking about? And, and I said, the most important thing, and if you're taking notes, write these three words down. And the reason why is this, cover, to cover in the Bible, this one thing comes through. Discouragement precedes destruction. Discouragement precedes destruction. I can't find anybody whose life fell apart, they screwed up their life, where they weren't discouraged first, okay? What do I mean by that? Nobody's ever come to me and said, man, I am so encouraged about how I'm doing in school, I'm dropping out. <laughs> Nobody's ever come up to these young couples, ever come to me, we are so encouraged about our marriage, we're getting a divorce. I'm so encouraged about what's going on in my church, I'm leaving my church. Discouragement is the quicksand that sucks you under and wrecks your future. And that's why I want to give you the most, for my, important, my, my money, the most important values verse in the entire Bible. If you have a Bible, turn to 1 Californians chapter 13, verse 13. Okay? If you don't know where Corinthians is, go to Genesis, hang a right, go a really long way. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the summary verse to the, one of the most important chapters of the Bible is this, 13, 13, there's this, now, he says, these three, matter of fact, it's on the screen there, these three remain, and theologically, this is a really big deal in the Bible, the first one is what? Second one is? Third one is? God's top three values are right there. These are the only things that last. These are the things that God says remains. Faith, hope, and love. You know what the problem is? This? Christians, we major in two of the three. We talk about faith all the time. Every church got a statement of faith. You check your statement. You're evangelical free. I love that. You got a statement of faith. Todd's got a statement of faith. And we talk about faith all the time, okay? I crammed three years of seminary into five years to study the Christian faith. Okay? The, um, and love. We talk about love all the time, sing about it all the time. It's hard to even mention the service. God loves you. Uh, all of this kind of stuff we get in small groups. The, uh, we talk about faith all the time. We talk about love all the time. Nobody ever talks about hope. And so after that conversation with my daughter, Leslie, I basically went, I'm going to write a book on hope. It took seven years to write because evidently I'm a very slow writer. And I wrote a book. Uh, called HQ, Hope Quotient, because for way too long, people thought their IQ was more important than their HQ, okay? And your hope level is more important than your IQ level. And the entire book was, here are seven things that if you build them into your life, you will have 
hope, and a future. And if you don't build these into your life, you will not have hope and you will not have a future. And what I want to do is I want to unpack. All I want to do this morning is, and I'm going to actually come out swinging. Is that okay with y'all? I'm going to give you the three most important questions any teenager will ever ask. Okay? And you adults, you're in this thing too. Okay, y'all ready? And you get these right, you will have a future. Matter of fact, you'll, you'll have an unbelievable, if you get these wrong, the, your entire future gets bankrupt and wrecked, your marriage gets wrecked, your kids, a whole thing goes south, okay? And so here they are. Question number one is this, are my spiritual batteries recharged? Are my spiritual batteries recharged? Okay, why is that a big deal? Does anybody here have an iPhone? Anybody got an iPhone? Okay, good. Any of you teenagers have an iPhone 10? Your parents should buy you one. You heard it from God in church. <laughs> the, um, the iPhone 10, um, this expensive iPhone, if the battery's dead, what's it worth? Nothing. It's nothing. You are not, the most important thing about you is this, are your spiritual batteries recharged? Uh, notice what the prophet Isaiah said. We're going to put it up on the screen. Those who hope in the Lord, notice where hope comes from. Hope in the Lord, which means I recharge my spiritual batteries. And the minute your spiritual batteries get recharged, what happens? Look what happens. It says this. It says will. It doesn't say it might. Number one, when your spiritual batteries get charged, it will renew your? You're going to be stronger just for showing up here this morning. Okay? Then you will soar on wings like you. your life will go to levels it would never go to without God and recharge your spiritual batteries. And then it says this. They will run and not grow where you will have stamina and they will and you will have a high resistance to discouragement and i actually believe this people these days are starving for what we have and don't even know it and the reason why is this and this is actually going to be fun i am going to take you through the last seven decades in america okay Americans have lost one thing in every decade that you cannot afford to lose and be healthy, okay? And I'm going to go ripping through these. Was anybody here born, was anybody alive in the 50s? Anybody alive in the 50s? The teenagers, look around, look around. These are relics, okay? The, um, <laughs> they are old, okay? Uh, in the 1950s, there's Americans lost. We'll put up Americans lost in the 50s. We lost innocence. Okay? I came home from World War II, everybody got a car, radio exploded, TV was invented, and here's the, in the 1950s, Hollywood started shaping values, and now the number one shaper of values in America is Hollywood. Is this good news or bad news? Who was here for the 1960s? Who remembers the 1960s? Okay? The 1960s, what are, Americans lost, here it is, Americans lost, authority. The phrase in the 1960s was, don't trust anyone over 30, okay? And Americans lost respect for authority, and that has never changed. Americans lost respect for government authority. They lost respect for biblical. Entire denominations have thrown out the Bible as a result of the 60s training them, rebel against God's authority, the Bible authority, all this kind of stuff. Now, who was around for the 1970s? Give me more. Are you around for the 1970s? Weird decade. The 1970s, here it is. Americans lost love. It was the weird dress decade, the paisley decade, the freak decade, and it was the free love, free sex decade, and at the end of the 70s, somebody said this, Americans starving for love settled for sex in the 1970s, and it's never gone back. The 19, who was here for the 1980s? Okay, the 1980s, here's what Americans lost, all sense, keep going, all sense of style, <laughs> right out the window in the 80s. Matter of fact, anybody recognize the guy in the middle? That's our worship leader at Bayside, Lincoln Brewster, during his days with Journey. Okay? Anybody recognize the guy in the back? That's Todd. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the 1980s, Americans lost, keep going, values. The number one movie for the 1980s was a movie called Wall Street, playing an actor named Michael Douglas, playing a character named Gordon Gecko. In that movie, he said this, greed is... Good. Just check out Christians' tithing records before and after the 19, before the 1980s, Christians tithe. After the 1980s, Christians tip. Because our values in the 1980s got thrown out and replaced with Hollywood's greed values. 
Okay? Now, the 1990s, watch this, give me almost all of the 1990s. Who's around for the 90s? Okay? The, um, that was a weird decade. Americans lost faith in the future. The Murrah Federal, Federal Building was on, the economy got shaky, and for the first time in history, American teenagers started saying, I don't think I will do as well as my parents. That never happened prior to the 1990s. And the real problem with that is that where there is no faith in the future, there is no power in the present. And that's happened in the 1990s. And then, now this better be pretty unanimous. Who was around for the 2000s? Okay, welcome. Uh, in the 2000s, Americans lost. Here it is, security. The decade started with Y2K. Remember that thing? That was followed by 9-11, which was followed by the economy crashing. And Americans feel more insecure than they've ever felt in history. And... The year, the, now the 2000s, which is unanimous in here, the 2000s, here it is, Americans as a result have lost hope. Seven years into this decade, we've lost hope. Now, if you add these up, go to the next slide, here's what it looks like. We've lost innocence, authority, love, values, faith, security, hope in 70 short years. Those things are just gone out of America. Now, look at that list for a second. Just check that out for a second. Do you need those things to be emotionally, psychologically healthy? Absolutely. Can you build a good marriage without innocence, authority, love, and values? No. Can you raise great kids? No. A lot of you teenagers are bringing up your parents. Can you bring the, the, now here's the problem is, everybody in our culture, this next 10 years, in my opinion, it's going to be the decade. It's no wonder our Christmas Eve services are blown sky high. You know why? Everybody knows they need those seven things, don't they? Like, talk to anybody. Do you need to feel more secure? Yes. Do you need a strong faith? Yes. You know, everybody, do you need love? Everybody knows they need those things. They can no longer get it from our culture, which means they're starving for it and don't know where to get it. We have the answer to the stuff everybody wants. What do I mean by that? Is this, where do you find innocence? You find that in the forgiveness from God. Where do you find authority? You find that in the word of God. Where do you find love? The love of God. Where do you find values? The word of God. Where do you find faith? The church, Christian church and the word of God. Where do you find security? Where do you find hope? You find all those things in a relationship with Jesus Christ in a church that is honoring God, teaching the Bible, and loving people in Jesus' name. That's America. We're, we're going to have an incredible decade, people, because everybody was starving for the stuff we have and doesn't know where to find it. That makes sense? Okay. And I actually, I'm very optimistic about the future of your church and every other Christian church that lives this stuff out because everybody's starving for that stuff and has no idea where to find it. Number one is this. The most important question you're asking about yourself is this. Are your spiritual batteries recharged or are you running on dead? Number two is this. Am I living to make great things happen? Number two is this, am I living to make great things happen? I'm going to come back to that one and end with that one in a second. Number three is this, am I future focused? Would you circle the word future focused? Circle those words. Am I future focused? Okay. And I want to give you two verses. Okay. One is Philippians 4.13. Just look at me for a second. Philippians 4.13. The apostle Paul himself says this, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. Discouraged people are almost always discouraged because they are looking back. And when you are looking back, you get nothing but the three G's, guilt, grief, and grudges. And all of those will sap all your strength and wreck you from having a great future. That makes sense? So we go, I have to buy this tape so I can get all this stuff. The, uh, the, and so the Apostle Paul says, the only way to be spiritually, psychologically healthy is to stop looking and start looking forward, okay? It's the only way to be healthy, okay? Your past will never take you where you want to want to go, okay? And so if you're going, well, let me give you one of my favorite quotes. This is so good, I put it in your outline. The, um, Beware of spending too much time looking back at what you once were when God wants you to become something you have never been. Uh, Todd, isn't in, is Todd in here? Oh, good to see you in church, man. 
Todd, you get that thing done in the parking lot we were talking about? We, we, I hope you know, so we're gonna try an experiment here. It'll be interesting to impact Redlands. While you're in here, Todd and the team have been putting, wind, they have taken duct tape and newspapers and they have taped all your windshields. <laughs> and after the service, we are inviting the entire church, just this service, because you're the sharpest people, we are inviting you all to drive home backwards. <laughs> just looking in your rear view mirror. Okay? You can drive forward if you want, but you're gonna drive home all the way just looking in your rear view mirror. Raise your hand if you're going to do this. All of you are going, I'm, yeah, every teenager, yeah, man, let's give it a shot. <laughs> Dad's wheels. The, um, um, you, <laughs> you know, um, you know, it says you're all looking at me going, Ray, none of us are stupid enough to drive that way. You are absolutely, none of us are stupid enough to drive that way. All of us are dumb enough to live that way. All of us are dumb enough to live that way. At church people especially, we're going to try something new to bring the future of our church. No, we can't do anything new in church. Let's look back for what we should do. Okay? When you look back, it just fills you with grief, guilt, and grudges, which hold. God brought you here today. And communion is about, some of you need to hear this, your past is past. God never gathers a group of people so that they can become more guilty. He gathers people to free them from their past and get them looking ahead. And some of you need to let go of your past today and you need to start believing for the first time that for you, your marriage, your future, and your church, God has better days ahead for you. The um, number three is this. Most important question, number three is, am I future focused? Number two is this, am I living to make great things happen. I'm pretty sure there's nobody in here that is this, but is there anybody in here over 25? <laughs> Probably not, but if there is, raise your hand really high, if you still can, okay? The, um, <laughs> um, wait, wait, raise your hand again, raise your hand again. Okay, teenagers, look around, look at all these people, okay? Now, if you're over 40, keep it up. There's probably nobody. Okay, look at these people. Why are you still here? <laughs> Why hasn't God taken you to heaven? Why are you still, you are only here for one reason. You are here so that you can take your life and make something great happen. That's why you're here. And for all of eternity, you're going to be going, man, I am glad I lived that way. Instead of living here and going, God gave me one life to make some great things happen for God and I played it safe the entire time and didn't do it, and all of eternity, you're gonna be going, why did I never pull the trigger and really live? To make, Carol and I have friends that if they would ever live to make great things happen, instead of just buy more stuff, the world would be a different place. And if some of you are going, well, what do you mean by that? I wanna give you a great verse. We're gonna put this verse back up. Now point, if you can, good. We are what? God's workmanship. Created in Christ. Great, you're going, hey, hey, that happened to me, man. Here, I came in here. I'm God's workmanship. God created me in Christ. I'm forgiven. I'm becoming what God wants me to become. Why would God do all that? Why did God save me? Why did God set me free from my past? Why am I a Christian? Keep reading the verse. To do good works, okay? Now, the problem is this, a lot of you go, well, I don't know about this. I'll give you another great quote. This is also so good, I put it in here. And if you're over 40, memorize this later. This should be posted somewhere in every American church. The, um, this is, George Bernard Shaw said this, teenager gonna love this. This is the true joy in life, being used for a purpose, recognized by yourself as a mighty one, and I love how he describes death, and being thoroughly worn out before you're thrown on the scrap heap. And he says, if you live that way, you will be a force of nature. Instead of being a feverish, selfish little clod of ailments and grievances, whining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. <laughs> that a great quote. The, um, for everybody that's ever fought stupid battles over church music, man, that is a great quote. Whining that the church won't make me happy. 
The, um, you are here for one reason, to make great things happen. Some of you are going, well, yeah, Ray, but you're a speaker, and you know, Lincoln can play a guitar, and Todd's amazing, and I got nothing. And you're going, God couldn't use me. I can prove God can use you. Years ago, I was a senior pastor in Southern California, and I resigned being a senior pastor and got a promotion and became a youth pastor. And I moved to, to, I moved to Marin County, California. Anybody ever heard of Marin or been to Marin? It's the wealthiest county in the United States. Back then, it was uh, it, the Golden Great Bridge connects Marin and San Francisco. Uh, Marin is so lily white, it's sickening. Okay, I mean, it is 97% Caucasian. And um, matter of fact, uh, Robin Williams, remember him, the comedian? Robin Williams said there's an ethnic detector on the Golden Gate Bridge. And any non-white yuppies that try to get into Marin, it flips them into San Francisco Bay. That's Marin. <laughs> I take a job at the church in the middle of the county that all the wealthy people going to it and all the executives going to it and all the wealthy folks. And you want to guess what their teenagers were like? I walk into high school, Sunday school class for the first time, and I realize I'm looking at 18 of the brightest, best-looking logo on everything, Porsche driving, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Redlands, bound <laughs> students ever. And I also realized this is the most apathetic, useless bunch of church brat kids I've ever seen in my life. I almost threw up. I went, I'm going to get these kids into missions and service if it kills me. I went back in the next week and I said, hey, what do you do during Easter? And I didn't let him answer because I said, because this year, and I said, and I gave him this hour-long manipulative pitch about going to, we're going to go to Mexico, we're going to serve with the poor, we're going to build people's homes, we're going to do all this kind of stuff. You're going to save lives down in Mexico. And at the end of this hour, I said, all right, who's going with me? And they all went, no, 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 no. 18 straight no's. I said, what do you do during Easter? They're all like, we ski. We ski in Vail, ski in Aspen, ski in Tahoe, ski in, you know, Mentone. We ski. <laughs> the, except, for, except, for, except for one girl, so, sophomore high school girl says, oh, every year we fly to Paris and shop. <laughs> and she said it like, didn't we all? You know, if people, it took six months of motivating, manipulating, Outright lying, okay? These, man, these high school guys, these big old guys are coming up there going, look, Ray, man, you, we, you got us, man. We know we should go to Mexico, but you don't get it. We ski together. It's a tradition. And I'm saying stuff like, bring your skis. The skiing in Mexico in April is <laughs> off the hook, okay? Well, April arrives, and we have 18 teenagers bound, gagged, and handcuffed, and on their way into Mexico. Most of those teenagers have still not recovered from that trip. We, they get down there, the first thing they see are four teenage guys setting a sent friend of theirs down by the side of the roads. No arms, no legs, evidently four amputations. And that got at them, okay? And parents with sick kids, ribs sticking out, little baby kids that couldn't afford like 10 bucks to get medical help or medicine, that got at them. People living on cardboard shacks got at them. And, and the teenagers start seeing this stuff, starting going, what happened? And I'm saying stuff, I don't know. Maybe they didn't have enough money to get medical help in time. That got it. But the big shocker was this. We go headquartered with about 1,000 other people from Azusa Pacific. And then on Sunday morning, for the first time ever, I got these 38 teenagers, and we caravan down to find our church, which is in the middle of nowhere. I mean, dirt roads, the whole thing. It's like Fresno, Mexico. And we finally pull up to what's... <laughs> We finally pull up to what's our church, and the second we pull up, we realize something's horribly wrong. Because we're supposed to be a church, and you're going to worship, and then together, and then have lunch, and then team up to bring the love of Christ to the community together and serve the community. It's a burnt out shell of a building. Roofs burned, crashed in, and now I have 38 teenagers looking at me going, way to go, Ray. And I'm thinking the same thing, until I hear noise on the inside of the building. So I go, wait, here. I tiptoe around to the back of this building, and I look through, and here's what I see. Up front, in this burned out building, there's a young, good looking, tough looking Mexican national pastor, and he is preaching his heart out to nine very discouraged looking people sitting on these charred benches. And now I think, what do we do? Do we go in? Do we stay out? What's polite here? And I thought, we just have a thousand miles, man. Let's go to church. So I wave these kids over. They kind of quietly come to the back, and all of a sudden, in the middle of nowhere, Mexico, this pastor, 38 white yuppies from Marin County following the back of this guy's church. He's so shocked, he stops his sermon. And he says, 
¿Qué pasa? Which translated means, what are you yuppies doing here? <laughs> and we had this kid that spoke uh, Spanglish, and he says, we're Christians, we're from the U.S., and this is exactly what he said, we're here to help and serve. Never done that before. We're to help and serve in any way we can. You could tell this pastor got this, and he gets real intense, and I'm thinking, he's going to kick us out. You could have cut the tension with a knife. I mean, he's glaring at our kids. He doesn't know who to trust. These, our kids are now getting scared. They're kind of backing up a little bit. These, especially the girls are like, should we be here? You know, stuff like that. And then the poor nine people in the middle have no clue what to do. <laughs> and this pastor gets real intense, and then he looks right at these kids and says, they, and we found out later, there's a gang in the village. And he points to these kids and says, they burned our little church down six months ago. And he looks at our kids and he goes, and for six months, we've been praying that God would send help to rebuild our little church. But we've given up any hope help would ever arrive. And here you are. Oh. I'm in the back going, doo -doo 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 -doo, one of these things. And then every, by the way, every church, every, every year school's got a big mouth kid. <laughs> they, and, every, and ours, ours, this kid named Matt, Matt can't help it. He's, he's not a humble kid. He blurts out, he hears this stuff, hears this pastor go, we've been praying. Here you he blurts out, and he goes, yo, we are an answer to prayer. You know what I'm saying? They were. We bought these beautiful, gorgeous Marin County High School girls, some who'd never even seen dirt. The, um, <laughs> they came down with truckloads of curling iron, because I forgot to tell them there was no electricity. And, uh, <laughs> and two days into it, they have stashed that stuff. Girls, you know that bandana thing that they throw their heads down there? They have, they have wrapped that up. And all these boyfriend-girlfriend hookups happen down there. Why? Because those girls have never looked more attractive because there is a sparkle in the eyes of girls that when they are serving and caring that is never there when the only thing they're living for is to try to look good, okay? And but with these high school guys, useless. <laughs> We're in the building the next day and they got, the same big mouth kid goes, we have a big team meeting. He goes, hey, why don't they have a roof? <laughs> I go, I burned down. He goes, why don't they put a new one on? Don't it ever rain down here? I'm like, it's a convertible church. <laughs> he goes, why don't we pay for it? They whip off a sombrero, and I watch the best offer here. These are Marin County teenagers. You know, wads like you've never seen. The Paris girl goes, can I use American Express Platinum? The, um, <laughs> And two days, in, two days later, they are finishing putting an entire brand new roof on the church. High school guys and girls and local villagers did the whole project together, finished the roof in two days, brand new roof, which didn't do any good anyway, because by the end of the week, so many people were coming to the evangelistic services at night in this church that we had to move out of the church outside. They're showing Jesus movie on the wall, lead people to Christ. Our kids are doing the entire thing. They arrived back at school. Their friends are like, wow, nice tan. Where'd you go? Vail, Aspen, Tahoe? No, where'd you go? Mexico. Can't ski in Mexico, what'd you do? An hour later, our kids are chasing them down to class going, I built a church, I saved people's lives, I'm an answer to prayer, okay? <laughs> that, when people stop spectating and start serving, a church explodes. That exploded our youth. Next year, we had 86 high school students sign up to go to Mexico. That was created a problem. We had no church vehicles. Do you guys have any church vans? Yeah, these, most of this you say repaint instead of repent anyway. The, um, and, and so I get, up, I get up on Sunday morning, just like this, in Marin County, and I said, we're taking 86 teenagers to Mexico. We need to borrow your cars. That was their exact response. No cars. The next week, this guy named Al got up and he said, did you hear the rumor about our church? The adults in our church are willing to send their kids, but not their cars, to Mexico. It's <laughs> awesome. 18 people donated vehicles that Sunday to go down. One guy, Tim Stanish, donated a four-door Mercedes-Benz, which I drove to protect. I felt responsible for the thing. <laughs>
As long as I live, people, I will never forget being in the middle of nowhere, Mexico, in a burned out shell of a building with 38 teenagers who'd never done anything like this, running around going, I'm an answer to prayer. And I thought to them, they are exactly right. Because the second you serve, the second you love God, the second you love people, the second you say, I'm going to actually make great things happen Why I'm here, you wake up and discover you have become the answer to somebody else's prayers. My last question is this, why would you want to live any other way? All God's people said, amen. Amen.